welcome to a collection of our best and spookiest. We are currently working on our greatest Halloween special yet, so this year for Debunktober we wanted to give ourselves all the time necessary to make something incredible for you guys. Before that comes out, we put together a nice bingeable compilation of some of our old Debunktober videos. Some of our absolute favorite videos of all time are in here, so if this is your first time seeing these, please enjoy. And if you've seen these before, I hope you enjoy the stroll down memory lane with us. Some of these videos are older, so voiceover, scripting, and editing may be a little outdated, so please excuse some of the more antiquated aspects in these. With that, sit back, grab a pumpkin spice something, and enjoy Debunktober. London After Midnight is a 1927 horror mystery film starring legendary character actor Lon Chaney, who most people know from playing Eric in The Phantom of the Opera. The movie was distributed by MGM and directed by another legend in horror, Todd Browning, who directed 1931's Dracula, a staple of horror today. As you could tell from the intro and some past videos we've made, specifically the older who inspired, Jeff and I are extremely into classic horror especially Universal Monsters, the best kind of stuff to get into this Halloween. But so far, all I've done was talk about the movie lightly, so let's talk more in depth about what the movie was. Well, I'm afraid I can't do that today, because London After Midnight has been lost since 1965 when MGM's film vault set ablaze and hundreds of other films were lost. London isn't just notorious for its disappearance, but also its alleged curse. Before getting into the meat of this video, I want to explain how a movie could be lost, or especially lost to a fire. Now, I know you all aren't stupid, I'm not gonna sit here and explain this to you all like children. Obviously VHS and home releases weren't available in 1965, so older films' only copies were stored in warehouses. Film was extremely flammable and we have lost many classic films, not just horror, to the unfortunate short-sightedness of preserving these old films. Now first, we are going to discuss the overall appeal that drives horror fans to hopefully one day see this movie. Well, a lot of this film still exists. London After Midnight, in its entirety, is gone, yes, but don't let that get you down. Tons of stills and promotional images still exist, and the famous picture of Lon Chaney in his makeup dressed in a cloak, top hat, and decked out with two rows of sharp teeth, in my opinion, is enough to drive the interest in this movie. But trust me, everyone is different. I already briefly brushed upon the star power this movie held in just its director and star alone. It's so hard to understand how huge Lon Chaney was, and for countless of his movies to just go missing, especially since it was directed by Todd Browning. If images aren't enough and you're just itching to know what the story's about, then you are also in luck, because the script still exists. That's right, the entire script is on Google for anyone to read and has also helped in piecing the stills together to make a semi-movie, which is what happened in 2002, when the stills coupled with music made up a pseudo-remaster of a long-lost movie. Will it ever be found is certainly the question of the century. Every now and again, the horror community will get wind of it possibly still being out there in wreckage or in a private collection. It feels like every five years there will come a news article claiming to have found it, only to lead to false hope. I don't think London is truly lost. I think it still might be out there in someone's collection, but we won't know until those collectors or film historians possibly find it in an old abandoned warehouse with thousands of old tapes. I briefly touched upon its remake in 2002, which again isn't truly a remake, but a Frankenstein of pictures matched to the script to simulate how it could have looked. There is technically a reboot, Mark of the Vampire, which many consider it to have the same plot, and this one actually starred Dracula himself, Bela Lugosi. There were rumors of making a modern reboot of the film for I don't know how long. The plan was to get Ron Chaney, Lon Chaney Sr.'s grandson. It could work, as Ron is only 65 as of this recording, so hopefully, all goes through. Mm -hmm. 
No, to the curse. This is by far the wildest of anything I've talked about so far. In 1928, a year after the film's release, Robert Williams claimed to have seen horrifying visions of Lon Chaney's character from the film that convinced him to murder Julia Mangan with a razor. It was published in newspapers that it seems Lon Chaney can terrify anyone. Unfortunately, two years later, Chaney died of a throat hemorrhage. Was this film really enchanted? This really adds to the allure, a lost film with somewhat hazardous intentions. So what to make of all this? All of it together. The loss, the supposed curse, it's a lot to take in, especially for anyone not familiar with older films. This video is a special and sort of way to explain this story, but it's still a mystery as to where London After Midnight truly, truly is. Personally, I think it'll be found one day, but that might just be blind optimism. You might or might not have an idea of how badly Jif and I want to see this film. Fingers crossed. Hi, and welcome to Debunk File. My name is Sep, and today we're going to be talking about the mystery of the many Creature from the Black Lagoon reboots. For our first edition of this year's Debunktober, we're going to be talking about what we love more than anything else in the world, universal monsters. And really, what's not to love? Macabre sets, eerie acting, and atmosphere so thick you can feel the smog and smoke emerge from your TV until you're submerged in the darkness and glued to the silver screen. Perfect for this time of year. As the years went on, horror began to evolve. By the 50s, gone were the days of the vampire and werewolf. It was a creature fest. With the advent of space travel and the interest in technology increased, horror movies became less about gothic horror and more about the terror that lurked in the stars and in science. Mutants and aliens became the new hit horror fad, and with Universal being the king of horror, they needed to adapt to maintain their status. That's why in 1954, they created a mutant monster flick called the Creature from the Black Lagoon, starring Julie Adams, Ben Chapman, and Rico Browning, playing the creature on land and underwater respectively. As a crazy fun fact, as of this recording, Rico Browning is still one of the last few Universal Monsters actors still alive at the ripe age of 90 years old. The film was of course a success, and truly birthed the horror sci-fi drive-in phenomena. It gained two sequels, there was Revenge of the Creature in 1955, and The Creature Walks Among Us in 1956. That was the last we saw of Gilman and his own movies, but he did make an appearance in The Monster Squad and The Monsters. With all of that said, everything changed for our friend Gilman when the 1990s rolled around. In 1999, the Mummy reboot opened to an insane success, which naturally greenlit a reboot for our beloved Gilman. Gary Ross was set to write and produce the film, but it never happened. As you will see, this will become a very common theme throughout this whole video. You see, there hasn't been a reboot of the Creature movie ever, and they've been in talks since the 80s. So today we're going to pick apart each failed attempt at a reboot, and trust me, there's a lot, and find out why they never made it into cinemas. Let's begin. In 1982, we had our first confirmed report of a Creature from the Black Lagoon reboot being made. Jack Arnold, the director of the original 1954 film, was set to direct alongside John Landis with Nigel Neal as the writer. This story, and the first known failed attempt at a Creature reboot, is pretty straightforward, but it's definitely worth mentioning. Neal had finished the script, which centered around two Gilmen, one good and one evil, being attacked by the Navy, and it was set to film in 3D, which was the big kicker. Universal had no incentive to film this movie in 3D, and due to Jaws 3D in production, they didn't want the films to clash and possibly split the box office earnings, which could doom both films. The budget concerns were there as well. Universal knew that Jaws would work, but unfortunately were unsure of Creature, and it seemed the popularity of 3D faded once again. That was a big drawing point, and also, Arnold did not want to come back due to his involvement with the Love Boat series, so the movie was never made and the first attempt was canned, until 1992. In 1992, the second failed attempt, and probably the most famous, was set to be directed by the legend himself, 
John Carpenter, who in fact knew a thing or two about reboots done right as he directed The Thing, which was a remake of the 50s B-movie classic, The Thing from Another World. Anyways, Carpenter was assigned by Universal with another film legend, Rick Baker, to do the makeup effects, and Bill Phillips was assigned to write the script. This seemed like the obvious choice for a creature reboot. The talent is here, and we know how well it could work, especially with Carpenter being a veteran in the horror genre, as his name alone could have elicited a huge box office draw. So why it was never given a green light is baffling. Now though, it's time to find out why this possible classic was never put to film. Carpenter faded into obscurity after the success of Halloween, and he mainly worked on cult films. The Thing, while an absolute classic now, wasn't successful and was hated by most general audiences. Actor Chevy Chase won Carpenter to direct the horror comedy Memoirs from an Invisible Man, which did pretty crappy, but it was big enough and hadn't come out yet, possibly giving Carpenter another shot at more expensive projects. He settled on, of course, a remake of Creature. His plan was to make it almost Lovecraftian in style, drawing beats from Shadow of Innsmouth, and with Rick Baker as the makeup artist and production designer, things like that were possible. A maquette does exist. It lies in Carpenter's horror man cave as seen in a documentary about the director's life and films. Unfortunately, as mentioned, Memoirs from an Invisible Man was a total flop, and that's the main reason most people point to when asking why this potentially amazing film never got the go-ahead. The film was in limbo, either waiting to start shooting or waiting to be cancelled, and neither happened. Universal failed to give it any recognition and the movie was kicked. With Carpenter gone and Rick Baker waiting for a new director, they chose Ivan Reitman of Ghostbusters fame, who didn't agree with Baker's idea of the creature and started to make it more monster than man, but we'll get back to Reitman's involvement later. There are many theories as to why this movie never got made. As mentioned, the failure of Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Carpenter's fall from grace from hotshot to cult filmmaker, or Universal's neglect for the entire project leading to Carpenter's impatience and leave to work on other things. And honestly, I think it's a little bit of all of them. On one hand, it's not Carpenter's fault that Memoirs of an Invisible Man failed, but it showed executives at Universal that the general public wanted nothing to do with classic monsters, which ties into Universal's complete blind eye to the whole creature project at all. And of course, there was Carpenter's impatience. He did make a movie two years later, so it seems he was either going to devote time to the reboot or get back to filmmaking. It's near impossible to pinpoint which it could have been, but again, I think it's safe to say a little bit of all fed into the creature reboot being dropped. Until 1995. In 1995, writers Herschel Weingrod and Timothy Harris proposed a script to Universal, which we can assume they liked because they were now looking for a director, and they looked at none other than Peter Jackson. This is another straightforward one here, but worth mentioning. So, to make a long story short, Jackson had no interest in the project and instead expressed interest in making a King Kong movie, which eventually, in 2005, he did. But two years later, he made his classic Lord of the Rings series. This makes sense. Jackson had a vision and knew what he wanted to do. If this film did happen, we might not have had the Lord of the Rings or 2005's King Kong. So, it's safe to say that I'm kinda glad this one stayed in the vault. So yes. Another creature reboot canned, and I know what you're all thinking. Yes, until 1996. In 1996, the aforementioned Ivan Reitman, director of the Ghostbusters movies, was up to helm the reboot. But that's pretty much all we know. He was going to do it, and he didn't. It's just common knowledge that's tossed around when talking about the failed reboots. On my hunt to find anything, I only ever found passing comments about his alleged involvement. It's a complete mystery, if he was ever even set to direct. The script was to be the same one that Carpenter was working from, just Reitman directing. It might have just been an idea in Universal's brain, but it's obvious they had no interest, so maybe Carpenter recommended him. It's nearly impossible to pinpoint anything about Reitman's involvement. No matter how deep I dig, I kept hitting a brick. Maybe one day we'll get an answer, but I think our answer may lie in a deep lagoon somewhere. And that was the end of the Creature reboot, of course, until 1999. We now circle back from where we started, with the success of the 1999 movie The Mummy, seeing a reboot of an old monster movie done in an almost Indiana Jones action-adventure style made Universal start second-guessing their distaste in a new creature movie. 
We talked about this at the very beginning, but to recap, the movie was set to be written and produced by Gary Ross. The script in question seemed to either be done or roughly done, because the plot was there and had been stated as a clash between civilized men and primitive men. Going with a more action route, the film would include a huge epic battle set piece like The Mummy, instead of relying on slow burn horror that made the original so scary at the time. It was in 2001 that Ross signed on for a remake and obviously it never happened. But in 2008 in a Q&A, Collider asked Ross about specifics on the project and he had this to say. What's going on with the creature from the Black Lagoon? I'm producing it. We're actually moving forward. What's the tone of it gonna be? It's not going to be campy. It's not a reference to what the original was. It's not reverential that way. We take it seriously. We found some scientific underpinnings for it, which my dad actually found in the original. He based it on a lungfish he found around that time. A lot of that was his. We're not approaching it in a campy, retro sort of way. Is it going to be based on the original and the sequels? Well, it's certainly going to be based on the original. My dad's favorite was The Creature Walks Among Us, and that was the last one which my dad also wrote. My dad actually died two weeks ago. We're going to be faithful to it. Does it have a director yet? That hasn't been decided yet. Will the creature be live or CGI? Well, those are decisions that will always be made during prep. The movie is not greenlit, let me say that. But we hope to be making it sometime next year. Is it going for scares though? Oh yeah, I don't think we're going to wink at the audience or make it silly in any way. I think we're going to take it seriously. It really looks like Ross was going to take this film very seriously and was really looking forward to getting a director on board and getting started. This was the last we heard about it from Ross, as it's been over a decade, and of course, there's no reboot to be found. Ross's vision would have surely been interesting, so it's a real shame it never made it to the screen. The take was fresh enough, and Ross surely had a ton of respect for the original, so it's safe to say this could have been a hit, or even a cult classic. But why did this get canned? God, I have no clue. Especially with the success of The Mummy, this should have been an absolute no-brainer. It would have made money regardless if it was bad. I'm really starting to think these attempts are somehow cursed. And yes, this was the last attempt, until 2002. Bear with me on this one here, because it might sound a bit familiar. Regardless, in 2002, Guillermo del Toro was attached to direct a new reboot after years of failure. And again, this seems like a no-brainer. Del Toro was a huge fan of the original and monster movies in general. Del Toro presented the idea of a more romantic movie focusing on the creature's love for the woman, a true Beauty and Beast story. Universal wasn't a fan of the very abstract idea and dropped him, but Del Toro isn't done yet. He'll be back. The reboot was picked up by writer Teddy Serafian, and the script was set to start writing in March of 2003. Two years later, in 2005, the movie found a director, Breck Eisner. Eisner wanted a very alien and the thing-esque story for the creature, and making the Gilman's origin tied to pollution and corruption. Unfortunately, during this time, which is around 2007 to 2008, the writer strike happened, halting all production on the reboot. Eisner decided to finish his film, The Crazies, and then go back to Creature when that was over and done for. When it came time to film, it was decided to film in Brazil and on the Amazon River in Peru, right on location with minimal CGI. Allegedly, a boat set from the movie exists, but the evidence of that is scarce. The script was being retooled, and it was looking like we might finally get our creature from the Black Lagoon movie. And just like that, it stopped. It was gone forever, until of course, in 2009. In 2009, it was thrown around that a movie called The Black Lagoon was being made. A reboot with a retooled name that would be produced by Mark Abraham and Gary Ross. By 2011, the film was abandoned and would continue into 2012. In 2012, we had a semi-dark universe creature movie again titled The Black Lagoon. Universal hired Dan Kajganich to write the film for a 2014 March release. And, well, it never came out. It was tried again by seemingly the same crew, but this time with big name actors like Chris Evans and Scarlett Johansson. This reboot was set to appear on the scene in 2020, which obviously hasn't happened. Yet. As of recording, we still have a few months left of 2020, so anything can really happen, but without a trailer or any news, I highly doubt it. Going back a few years to 2017, we finally had our creature reboot. Well, 
sort of. If at least you count Guillermo del Toro's masterpiece, The Shape of Water, which took the concept of the original with a sympathetic, albeit dull creature, into a sympathetic and monstrous, but extremely intelligent, loving monster. It's a great film and really serves as a reboot or even a sequel to the original. Alas, it's not canon and not recognized as a universal picture. So it's up to you where you can put this movie. And that's it, the complete history of the oddity that seems to be the Creature from the Black Lagoon remake. Will it ever see the light of day from the depths of the murky lagoon? Maybe. With the release and success of Universal's The Invisible Man, I think it's very safe to say that the Dark Universe is back, baby, and I think Creature might crawl his way out soon. Hi, and welcome to Debunk File. My name is Sepp, and today we're going to be talking about the most famous unidentified serial killer in American history. The one, the only, the Zodiac Killer. That's right, for our second video of this year's Debunktober, we're going to be discussing this demented figure. As you all know, we've said this plenty of times before, but we tend to not cover unsolved murder cases because we feel like we can't really add anything to them. But of course, every rule has its exceptions. Possibly our most outstanding video of the year so far was on the Black Dahlia, but ironically, today's case takes place in the same state, California. From December 1968 to October of 1969, the Zodiac Killer took the lives of five confirmed victims, but claimed to have taken the lives of as many as 37. Similar to the case of the Black Dahlia, there is a lot of misinformation, although this time the leading cause isn't yellow journalism, as you will soon see. While this case doesn't contain that much information in terms of what the killer did, there is a metric ton of misinformation regarding the suspects, so once again, we are here to attempt to tell it right. Now, it should go without saying, but again, this is literally the most famous unsolved murder spree in the history of the United States, besides probably Jack the Ripper. It's likely the most famous unsolved string of murders in the world. Something about a man that completely outsmarted and tormented everyone looking for him is just terrifying yet fascinating at the same time. As a result, he has been represented in pop culture a plethora of times. Just about every fictional serial killer picked it as a tortured genius or sending letters to the public is drawing from Zodiac. This has actually led to most people believing serial killers are always smart, when that is certainly not true most of the time. You name the media, and the Zodiac has been there. Music, literature, video games, television, a bizarre internet meme involving a politician, you've got it. There have been, of course, quite a few movies based either directly or indirectly off of him, with the most notable being David Fincher's 2007 film, Zodiac. That movie is one of the rare cases of an absolutely fantastic film based on an unsolved series of murders, unlike some of the others, including Jack the Ripper and, of course, the Black Dahlia film. On the subject of fame, something almost as famous as the killer himself is the relentless pursuit that many people have engulfed themselves in when attempting to catch him. And as we all know, nobody ever did. The psychological effects of trying to catch this killer are so infamous. It was actually the main plot point of the aforementioned Zodiac movie. As the film's tagline said, there is more than one way to lose your life to a serial killer. People have literally ruined friendships, careers, marriages, and even their own lives trying to solve this case. And tonight, we might do the same. In order to figure this all out once and for all, we need to go through the detailed timeline of the Zodiac's reign. We're going to talk about everything this man did, from start to finish. After that, we will of course, give our input on who the killer might have been all along. The last request I have is to simply sit back, relax, and turn those lights off. Let's do this. On December 20th of 1968, the very first confirmed murder attributed to the Zodiac Killer occurred. The victims on this tragic night were 17-year-old David Faraday and 16-year-old Betty Lou Jensen. They just began dating two weeks prior and this was officially their first date. Faraday promised Jensen's parents that they would be back by 11pm. Unfortunately, as we know now, they would never return home. Around the time Faraday had promised to return, someone stopped their car and got out. 
This man ordered Faraday and Jensen to get out of the vehicle. As Faraday was leaving the car, he was suddenly shot in his head. Jensen tried to flee, but was shot in the back five times. The crime took place at Lake Herman Road in Benicia, California. As we know, the killer was never caught. At the time, obviously with this being the first victims, the Zodiac Killer wasn't known yet, and so the police assumed that this was just a senseless act of violence. They of course searched for this killer for a while, but by the end of the summer, they all but halted. There were no witnesses to the crime, and the killer left no evidence outside the 22 caliber bullet cartridges. The most famous thing about the Zodiac Killer was the relentless letters that he would send to the police in various newspapers. But this didn't begin just yet. So at the time, this case, while quite tragic, like any other murder, wasn't viewed as anything extraordinary. Yet. It took until July 4th of 1969 for the next killing to happen, and this is when his infamy truly began. At Blue Rock Springs Park in Velaho, which was a mere 10 minutes away from the previous site, 22-year-old Darlene Farron and her friend 19-year-old Michael Magot were enjoying the 4th of July celebration. Suddenly, a car pulled up next to them just before midnight and just as quickly drove away, only for it to return a few minutes later. The driver got out and walked towards Farron's car, holding a flashlight in his hand. Mago briefly saw the man for a second before being blinded by the light. At that exact moment, the man began shooting the two with a 9mm pistol. Farron was hit three times and Mago was struck two times. As the man started to walk away, Mago began screaming in pain, resulting in the killer coming back and shooting him two more times. When help arrived, little could be done for Darlene Farron, as she was dead on arrival. However, by good fortune, Michael Mago managed to survive despite gunshot wounds to his face, neck, and chests. And then, the most infamous aspect of the case began. Roughly 45 minutes after the shooting, Velaho Police Department dispatcher Nancy Slover received a call from a payphone. It was a man with a very low, monotone voice. He gave Slover the following message. I want to report a murder. If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway, you will find kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. A few weeks later, on August 1st, the letters began coming in. Three letters were sent to the Valaho Times Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner, each repeating the same message. Dear Editor, I'm the killer of the two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman and the girl last 4th of July. To prove this, I shall state some facts which only I and the police know. And, well, he did. On this message, though, there was one other thing he said. If you do not print this cipher by the afternoon of Friday, August 1st, 1969, I will go on a kill rampage Friday night. I will cruise around all weekend, killing lone people in the night, then move on to kill again, until I end up with a dozen people over the weekend. With these letters, he included ciphers that looked like this. And this would become a common theme. He'd send in ordinary letters and attached to them were ciphers that he claimed would reveal his identity. On August 7th, another letter was sent, and this time the killer gave himself a name. The letter began with the now infamous phrase, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. The next day, Donald and Beatty Harden of Salinas, California managed to crack the 408 symbol puzzle. The message read as followed, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with the girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and the ones I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name, because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for the afterlifes. The numerous spelling mistakes appear intentional. The message deranged. The last part of the message has never been deciphered. These letters promising more crimes and answers, along with tormenting police, was only the beginning. Fast forwarding to September 27th, the Zodiac Killer would, unfortunately, strike again. This time he did it at Lake Berryessa, about an hour away from the previous two murders. And again, we had a victim somehow survive. On this day, friends Brian Hartmill and Cecilia Shepard were both spending time at this lake, and while lying down they noticed a strange man approaching. 
The man was dressed in a bizarre costume that resembled an executioner's hood with the Zodiac's trademark symbol stitched onto the front. He was wearing a pair of clip-on sunglasses to hide his eyes. He was carrying a knife and a pistol. He claimed that he had recently escaped prison and was robbing them of valuables. After talking for upwards of 15 minutes, the man bound both Hartnell and Shepard with a clothesline. Just as the situation appeared to be ending, the man took out his knife and started brutally stabbing both Hartnell and Shepard. Hartnell was stabbed six times in the back. Shepard was stabbed ten times in the front and back. After the killer had left, a fisherman had spotted Shepard and Hartnell and got help. Both victims were rushed to the hospital, where Shepard fell into a coma that she'd never awake from, and Hartnell miraculously survived the stabbing. Like last time, the police once again received a call from the man himself an hour after the attack. He called the Napa County Police Department, with Officer David Slate picking up the call. Like before, he spoke in a monotone voice. I want to report a murder. No, a double murder. They are two miles north of Park Headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Karma G. When asked who he was, the man then began walking away, but not before saying, I'm the one who did it. Unlike previous attacks, the Lake Berryessa attack left behind a lot of evidence, in addition to a witness surviving. Some women noticed a strange man in the area right before the attack. In addition, tire and shoe prints were recovered. Hartnell's testimony is quite important as he was with the Zodiac for roughly 15 minutes. Unlike Michael Mago, Hartnell got quite a good look at him, resulting in several police sketches, both of him in costume and from reports of a strange man around the lake before the attack began as pictured here. One thing I find interesting is that the drawing here doesn't at all resemble the ultra-famous sketch we always see that was drawn following the fourth attack. One last piece of evidence was found on Hartnell's car. The Zodiac drew his symbol onto the car door along with the dates of the past two murders. This next attack happened less than a month later on October 11th in San Francisco around 9.55pm. For this one, the Zodiac posed as some random guy on the street that needed a taxi ride. Naturally, at the end of his taxi ride, he shot the driver, 29-year-old Paul Lee Stein in the head. The weapon was again a 9mm pistol, although it wasn't the one used to kill Darlene Farron. After the murder, three kids in a house near the murder watched a man get out of the cab, wipe down some of the blood, and walk away. They quickly reported this crime to the police. However, due to a deeply unfortunate mix-up, the police set out looking for a person of color. Officers Donald Fuke and Eric Zelms remember driving to the crime scene and passing a white man with light hair and glasses. When the dispatcher fixed the error, the officers realized that was probably the killer, but they couldn't find him. Despite this incredibly bad luck, some good evidence was still found at the crime scene. Among the evidence included bloody fingerprints that likely belonged to the killer. In addition, the kids were able to provide a clear description of the killer, resulting in a police sketch and that is the one we all know. At first, San Francisco police assumed it was a robbery gone wrong until more letters were sent in. The letters that the police and the press got were unbelievably horrible. The first one starts off with the usual, where he claims that he was the murderer of the taxi driver, and proves it, this time with fragments of Paul Stein's shirt. However, he then mentions that he could have been easily caught as stated earlier, but wasn't. The ending though is where we see how truly demented this man was as this is one of the most disturbing messages you will ever see, especially if you are a parent. School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a bus some morning, just shoot out the front tire and pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. The Zodiac Killer was now basically a terrorist. Police had to send escorts to school buses, parents across the state were horrified, and this event would leave a lasting mark on many children, including a young David Fincher. The murder of Paul Stein would mark the last confirmed killing that the Zodiac had attributed to his name, but it does not end there at all. In fact, from this point forward, his letters only became more and more common. On November 8th, the San Francisco Chronicle received a new Zodiac sign to decode as well as another letter, where he requests the code he made to be put on the front of newspapers because he's been getting lonely, and if he gets lonely, he may do his thing. The following day, he wrote some more. This time, he mentions his growing anger regarding the police, who, according to him, made up lies about him, such as leaving fingerprints, when he claimed to have never done so. In fact, he explained in great detail how he tricks the police in his crime scenes. 
Because of this anger though, he will no longer let the police know when he murders someone. One other thing he said was that he really didn't look like the sketches that had depicted him in everyday life. Whether he's telling the truth or not is unknown, but it's definitely something worth noting for the future. The overall letter is more unhinged than usual. He brings up the aforementioned school bus plan and reveals that he has made a bomb and wrote down all the material he used to make said bomb. A month after that, he returned once more, this time asking for help, claiming that he can't remain in control for much longer and might take his ninth and tenth victim soon. This time, that's all he said, and naturally, the massive panic continued. By this time, he was known far and wide across the United States, and the outrage to catch him was at an unbelievable level, especially if you lived in California. For a few months, the Zodiac was silent, but of course, he was still talked about by millions each and every day. He would return eventually, though. On April 20th of 1970, the Zodiac Killer would return once more, this time writing a note with a code that supposedly revealed his real name. And two months after that, he made another code that allegedly told where his bomb was, among many other things. He claimed that he shot another man, and also claimed to be upset that civilians weren't wearing the Zodiac buttons on their clothes. He ended the note by saying that the police had until next fall to dig up his bomb. At this point, the messages start getting a little bit repetitive, as pretty much all of them include him either getting mad at the people of San Francisco and threatening them with various things, or him doing the same but with cops. However, one of them was pretty terrifying, as it mentioned him owning and threatening to torture slaves, which is something we obviously can't prove or disprove, but is most definitely something I did not know about coming into this mystery. But here is where things get really strange. After 1971, there was actually a gargantuan three-year gap until the next letter, which came in January of 1974. Nobody has ever figured out what caused this gap. We don't know if he left the country, was thrown in prison, or perhaps just intentionally stopped. In the three-year time frame, some citizens tried to solve the case on their own. The most notable attempt at the time was by a pizzeria owner, who made a B-movie called The Zodiac Killer, entirely as a ploy to catch the real killer. It unfortunately didn't work. When he finally returned, the Zodiac mailed quite a few letters in a short time frame. But then on July 8th, he would send one more message, and never return. Again, there's another bizarre part to this final letter, and by extension, the last four in general. They didn't include threats at all, and were all talking about random subjects such as praising the film The Exorcist as a wonderful satirical comedy, complaining about how violent the film Badlands was, and mentioning columnist Marco Spinelli, who was the subject of his very last letter. He didn't even refer to himself as the Zodiac either, leading some people to be suspicious as to if these were authentic letters. Throughout his letter campaign, he kept marking them with a kill count by Zodiac, followed by the phrase, SFPD equals zero. This exorcist letter came with the message, me equals 37, SFPD equals zero. Some more letters were reported after 1974, but it seems pretty likely they were fake. Overall, I find these final letters incredibly interesting. However, from this point on, we are left in the dark regarding the whereabouts of this killer. Perhaps he died, or perhaps he felt content with his work and just stopped. And that about wraps up the timeline of the Zodiac. Of course, with this case, there are hundreds of theories and myths, and if we went over each and every single one of them, we would probably be here until the next millennium. But whenever one arises due to a suspect, we will go over it. Speaking of suspects, I think it's about that time. Unlike our last true crime case, we aren't going to have 10 suspects, as we instead narrowed it down to just six. Compared to last time, there obviously isn't as many subjects. However, unlike our previous endeavor, where almost every single suspect has no convincing leads, this time, all of them have much more to them. So this is about to get interesting. Let's just get right into it. The first suspect is without question the single most famous of the entire case, and that is Arthur Lay Allen. He is at the center of the influential book Zodiac by Robert Gray Smith. The David Fincher Zodiac film, which is based on the book, features Allen quite heavily. 
Allen served in the U.S. Navy until he was dishonorably discharged. He later became a teacher until he was fired for sexual misconduct with students. The story of how Allen became a suspect in the first place is also thoroughly intriguing. You see, back in the late 1960s, a man named Don Cheney was living in college with Allen's brother Ron, which naturally led to Cheney becoming friends with Allen. However, in 1967, Cheney supposedly claimed to Ron that Allen had attempted to molest his daughter. After this point, he claimed to have never seen Alan again. In 1971, Cheney wound up telling this story to a friend of his, and he included details that seemed to insinuate that Alan was the Zodiac Killer. In Cheney's story, he mentioned that Alan confessed his desire to kill couples at lovers' lanes using a gun with a flashlight attached to the barrel, which is somewhat similar to what the Zodiac did to Darlene Farron and Michael McGough. After telling the story, his friend reported Alan to the police, and the police subsequently interviewed Don Cheney for about an hour. In September of 1971, using the information given to them in the interview, the police officially listed Allen as a suspect. They took action in multiple ways, including interviews and other stuff we will get into a bit later. However, one important thing to note was that they searched Allen's trailer and found nothing implicating him in the crimes, so they really didn't take him seriously anymore after that. However, it doesn't end there. We're only getting started. You see, Allen owned a watch that featured both the name Zodiac and the Cross Circle logo. For many people, when hearing this, you might think that this is it. It's him. However, it's important to note that the word Zodiac and the symbol he used didn't just come from the Zodiac Killer. Now that might sound obvious, but yeah, the Zodiac logo has been around for a long time. The Zodiac watch company did indeed make watches with the Cross Circle logo, but they didn't invent the emblem. It comes from astrology. Also, it's worth noting that the watch was quite popular at the time. Details regarding when exactly Alan got this watch have also become shrouded in misinformation as the years have gone by. But the point is, having a Zodiac watch alone isn't exactly enough to prove that he was the man behind it all. It's minor circumstantial evidence at best. Once again though, there is still more to Alan's case, as this is only the start. Don Cheney also mentioned that Alan told him that he always wanted to taunt the police with letters, and at the time he supposedly told him this information. The Zodiac Killer hadn't started his reign yet. This is also used as a massive piece of evidence that Alan must have been the killer. But the thing is, we're going off of word of mouth, and it is impossible to prove that Alan actually said any of this stuff. Cheney's reliability gets called into question down the road, so keep it in mind. Now of course, while the before mentioned search of his trailer was the final thing the police did to him, it was not the first. The police questioned him multiple times, and they received admittedly interesting results. On the day of the Zodiac stabbing at Lake Berryessa, Alan told investigators that he had some bloody knives in his car, which is eyebrow raising. Being a hunter, Alan claimed that these knives were bloody because he used them on chickens that he ate, but yeah, this is quite self-incriminating and is extremely suspicious. When Alan was first considered a suspect for the Zodiac Killer, he supposedly liked the attention that came with it, especially since it essentially made people not focus on his molestation accusations, but he quickly started hating it. It's possible that since those knife comments came towards the beginning of his suspicions, he could have been playing it up for the character, which would be an incredibly stupid thing to do, but we have seen people do much crazier things, so I wouldn't say that's impossible. Even if that wasn't the case, it's possible that he was being genuine and actually did use those knives to kill some chickens. But overall, do I think Alan was the Zodiac Killer? Honestly, no. And I have multiple reasons for this. Almost all of it comes down from the whistleblower himself, Don Cheney. You see, his stories over the years are not only contradictory, but as the years went on, they started getting outrageous. In 2006, over 30 years after Don Cheney first started his claims, he was interviewed and claimed that Alan had taken him to a Zodiac crime scene, confessed he was hired as a contracted killer by the husband of one Zodiac victim, had known another victim, and much more nonsense. Cheney's behavior proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was making these stories up. Law enforcement even admitted that Cheney was not a trustworthy source of information. As for why he would do this, it's possible he was trying to get back at Alan for the supposed molestation attempt on his daughter. He also likely enjoyed the publicity as a result of this, and when combined with his increasing age, started making wilder and wilder stories as the years went on, accidentally contradicting himself on multiple occasions in the process. But there is one more important figure to this case, and he is perhaps the most significant reason Alan is as famous of a suspect as he is, and that is Robert Graysmith, the man who wrote the famous Zodiac novel from 1986. In this novel, he ran with the theory that Alan was the killer, and unfortunately, there is a ton of misinformation in it. 
One big point he made was that Alan's family supposedly stated that they knew Alan was the Zodiac Killer. However, this was not true. One other thing Graysmith claimed in his novel was that Alan was identified by multiple people who saw the Zodiac. And this is kind of true. Back in 1969, Mike McGough was interviewed by the police following the Blue Rock Springs shooting. When they asked him what the Zodiac looked like, he claimed that the Zodiac was short, estimated that he was about 5 foot 8, about 195 pounds, and had light brown, almost blonde hair. This did not match the description of Alan at all, who was 6 feet tall, about 250 pounds, and was practically bald. In 1991, after the book Zodiac was published, the police asked Mago again to describe what the Zodiac Killer looked like. And this time his description was completely different, as he mentioned a man who was 6 foot 1 and 250 pounds. He was then shown a picture of Alan and was asked to give him a score of certainty out of 10, and he gave it an 8 which sounds quite remarkable. This seems very promising, but it's just too difficult to trust a man who was so inconsistent with his descriptions of what he saw, especially when he was nearly blinded by a flashlight and only caught a glimpse of him for only a second. Not to mention this was decades later and Mago had lived a fairly rough life up to that point. Graysmith did use one other survivor from an attack to prove that Zodiac was Alan, and that was Brian Hartnell. Graysmith claimed he identified the Zodiac's voice as being Alan, However, this one was just not true, as Hartnell reportedly told investigators that there was nothing about Alan's physical appearance or voice that would include or exclude him as a suspect. There are also some other notable examples of misinformation regarding Alan's case as a result of the novel, such as Graysmith's claim that Alan had received a speeding ticket near the scene of the attack at Lake Berryessa, which is not true. Graysmith said Zodiac called the residence of famous lawyer Marvin Belly to tell him it was his birthday, which happened to be December 18th. Alan's birthday. This is incredibly false because the caller was proven to be from a patient in a mental asylum. The same patient who famously called Belly on live TV claiming to be the Zodiac. Graysmith also claimed that Alan had a map of the area on him, which was never proven either. Graysmith claimed that he was wearing the same type of boots that Zodiac wore at Lake Berryessa, which again, isn't correct. Graysmith of course claimed that Alan knew and stalked each victim, which once again was never proven. Farron did know a guy named Lee, but it wasn't Arthur Lee Allen. In all reality, the Zodiac probably didn't know any of these victims. These myths are all just scratching the surface, as this novel is absolutely filled to the brim with claims like these. Unfortunately, these claims have become so popular, they are almost universally accepted facts. The David Fincher film also sadly repeats some of these lies, making these lies even more well known. The most extensive example of a myth that is basically considered fact has to belong to the victim Darlene Farron. It is widely believed that she was stalked for many months before she was killed. This was featured in the Zodiac novel, the film, and is overall one of the most famous pieces of information revolving around the case. It all started in the late 1970s when Darlene's babysitter told police about a man sitting in a parked car outside of her home. After this, stories also came from both of Darlene's sisters about this supposed stalker. They got pretty insane too, as the babysitter mentioned that Darlene knew that this stalker killed somebody. When it got to identifying who the stalker may have been, both of the sisters identified Alan. However, they also identified some other people too. Their identification of the other people that weren't Alan is not even close to the biggest flaw with this specific piece of evidence, as this entire stalker story is very suspicious, and there is one reason for that. When this family was interviewed about the murder in 1969, soon after it happened, they never even mentioned this stalker once. And that just does not add up at all. With these insane stories that they mentioned, I simply don't see how it is possible that they did not talk about these stories then. The person they mentioned most was a strange coworker of hers that Darlene talked about. However, they never said anything about him being a stalker or anything, and also referred to him as George and not Alan. This family only started mentioning the supposed stalker in the late 1970s, close to a decade after Darlene's murder, and again, that does simply not add up at all. So I've never really been able to buy into this story fully, and as a result, I'm not going to use this as evidence of identifying Alan. I'll close off Alan's case by mentioning that after the murders, the police were able to retrieve DNA from several Zodiac letters, along with fingerprints on Paul Stein's taxi. This DNA did not match the DNA taken from one of the Zodiac's letters, and several handwriting experts concluded that Alan's handwriting did not match the Zodiac Killer's handwriting. All of this shows the unfortunate power that authors can possess in cases like these. We saw it last time with the Black Dahlia, and we're seeing it again here. Because of these fallacies, the vast majority of the public believes that Alan was in fact the Zodiac Killer. 
when the evidence does not add up. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence pointing to Alan, but upon closer inspection, it all falls apart. With everything we have said about Alan, I think it's safe to say that he has been debunked. So with all of that out of the way, let's move on to the next suspect. Now that the most popular culprit has been taken out of the equation, things are going to get a lot more interesting. For the second suspect on our list, we are going to be going over a man named Ross Sullivan. Ross Sullivan has quite a different story than any of the other suspects on the list, as he is mostly associated with a murder in 1966 that could be Zodiac related. Sullivan has really blown up recently due to prominently being featured on the History Channel's documentary series, The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer, which as we stated, sheds a lot of light onto our suspect here. Ross Sullivan was a library assistant at Riverside and later suffered from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Sullivan was suspected of being behind a murder at Riverside City College back on October 30th, 1966, more than two years before Zodiac's first confirmed attack. On that date, a woman named Cherry Jo Bates was beaten and stabbed to death in the college parking lot. One of the main reasons this drew the intrigue of many was because her murder featured a knife for a weapon and military boot prints, which were features that some of the Zodiac killings had. But by far, the most notable aspect here is the fact that Riverside Press Enterprise received a letter entitled the Confession, where the killer referred to the murder as a game, just like the Zodiac, and it's not the only written evidence. A poem was later found carved into a desk in the library, close to where Bates was murdered. In 1970, handwriting expert Sherwood Morrill claimed the writing on the poem matched the Zodiac letter's style. The Confession letter also shares some notable similarities with Zodiac. Both the murderer here and the Zodiac misspelled Twitch, and they both used the word squirm as well. In 1967, another letter was sent to the Press Express, claiming more murders will come. At the bottom of the letter, it appears there's a small Z. These are some remarkable similarities. And when I saw this, it really opened my eyes. One other notable similarity is that Ross Sullivan looks like the famous police sketch. And yes, he looks incredibly similar to the sketch. Finally, the Zodiac himself admitted in a letter that he was impressed that the Riverside murder was linked back to him, but promising there are plenty of more murders yet to be found. With all of this evidence put together, it suddenly seems like we have a very formidable culprit out there. But, while on the subject of sketches, I do want to very quickly mention that you must take the sketches with a grain of salt. Sketches are drawn based on descriptions made by people, and as we have seen earlier, people are simply inconsistent. Not to mention the people who saw Zodiac were, themselves, a victim, and it's hard to remember details after nearly dying. This is why I think it's a good idea to be skeptical of sketches when it's the only available evidence being used to assert someone's guilt. Because these sketches so often aren't going to look anything like the suspect they're based on, even of the two separate sketches of the Zodiac Killer we have, you can already see that they look absolutely nothing alike. So really, in this case, and in any criminal case, if someone looks like a sketch, it's not as strong a piece of evidence as you may think. I mean, the Zodiac sketch is a guy with a military crew cut and glasses in the middle of the Vietnam War. This doesn't narrow it down much. Unless there is also a pile of other legitimate proof to this case, don't rest on just a matching resemblance. Speaking of the case, let's get back to Sullivan and this Riverside case. Of course, we don't know for sure if Sullivan was even the killer of Sherry Jo Bates, especially with her files not being public. However, he was reported not on campus for a few weeks right after the murder. According to some of the staff at RCC, Sullivan also returned with completely different clothes, which for him was very noteworthy as he supposedly wore the same shirt for a very long amount of time right up until he left. With that being said, all of this makes it admittedly pretty plausible that he was behind the murder of Bates. But is there anything that proves that he was behind the Zodiac murders? Well, the way in which he possibly wrote those notes was unbelievably compelling. But several things unfortunately don't add up for Sullivan. For starters, we know that the Zodiac traveled via car, but Sullivan did not have a car. He drove around with a motorcycle. But besides that, it's really the lack of evidence that hurts Sullivan's case. There is nothing tying him to any Zodiac attack, and with the college being about 300 miles away from the other Zodiac crimes, you can't prove with absolute certainty that he was the guy behind the case. Sullivan's age is also a problem. He was in his 20s during the Zodiac's reign, and the lowest estimate of the age for the Zodiac is about 10 years older. It's also entirely possible that the Zodiac was never involved in the murder. 
Sherwood Morrill's verdict on the writing might look like a slam dunk, but other handwriting experts have expressed doubt that the writing styles match. Zodiac himself saying he did it obviously isn't strong enough evidence, as he would admit to anything that would make him seem even more powerful. It is technically still possible Zodiac was behind the Riverside murder, and that Ross Sullivan was the perpetrator, but I wouldn't be fully willing to put my money on it, not unless some big things come out revolving around him in the near future, which is entirely possible as he has become very popular recently, so who knows. For now though, there simply isn't enough evidence to prove that he was the Zodiac killer, at least not yet. So let's move on to our next suspect. The third suspect on our list here is a man named Richard Gajkowski. Gajkowski came into the public radar in the late 80s, slightly after Graysmith's Zodiac novel was released. As we said, this novel was unbelievably popular, and as a result, it birthed the theorization of many suspects as public interest in the case skyrocketed. One person out of Northern California was named Blaine Blaine, who pointed fingers at a man named Richard Gajkowski. Blaine was the writer for a counterculture newspaper called The Good Times, and one of the writers he worked with was Richard Gajkowski. In the mid-80s, Blaine wrote an 80-page document all about the Zodiac case. He wrote this with the intent of figuring out the ciphers and everything about the case, including who did it. However, the vast majority of his information came from the Zodiac novel, which, as we stated, was not very factual at all. Also, and this has to be said, there is a lot of, well, typos and grammatical mistakes. Despite taking almost all of the information from the Zodiac novel, Blaine Blaine spelled the author's name wrong and even got the date the book was released wrong. Blaine claimed to have visited crime scenes, libraries, and supposedly came across loads of evidence that his former employee was the Zodiac Killer the whole time. After finding this out, he stated that he investigated Gajkowski's family, friends, former employers, and employees, and recorded Gajkowski's telephone conversations without his knowledge or consent. He then wrote a 500-page manuscript all about Gajkowski, in which he then claimed that Gajkowski threatened his life as a result. Out of the entire 500 pages, there somehow isn't even one plausible piece of evidence. We've covered two suspects so far, and while we don't believe they were the Zodiac Killer, at least with those two, there were some suspicious moments where you could be like, okay, well I understand at least why they could be considered a suspect, but with this, I'm just in absolute awe. He seems to frame Gajkowski for a multitude of other murders that happened in California that bared slight similarities to the Zodiac, and just said that Gajkowski did it without even a single piece of evidence to prove it, besides the fact that he lived in the same state, which obviously isn't enough to attribute someone as a killer. He also goes on and on about something called the Golden Calf Killings and talks a lot about a cab driver Gajkowski killed. This driver was not Paul Stein, rather a man named Leonard Carl Smith, who was not considered a Zodiac-related murder. Blaine Blaine also supposedly told police multiple times about Gajkowski, and they understandably didn't take this very seriously. So the next thing Blaine did was mention how there had to be a cover-up going on, which again, featured no real evidence to prove that claim. However, there is one piece of actual evidence that has led supporters of Blaine to genuinely believe that Gajkowski did this, and that all has to do with Nancy Slover. Nancy Slover, if you recall, was the Valaho police dispatcher who answered the Zodiac call after the Blue Rock Springs attack. This means she knew what the Zodiac sounded like, when given a sample of Gajkowski's voice, she said that it was a match. On the surface, this is a humongous lead. However, it is not one that can be taken too seriously, and here's why. Slover said this all during a 2009 documentary entitled Mystery Quest that aired on the History Channel, and well, this was a whole 40 years after she heard the voice. The Zodiac call was not recorded, so she is going entirely by memory. Now a lot of people would argue, well, it was a very memorable voice, and that's a somewhat valid argument. The problem with this hypothesis is that she has claimed several other people sounded like the voice she heard. Slover has said that another suspect, Manson family member, Bruce Davis, sounded a lot like the Zodiac. Slover even said John Carroll Lynch, the actor who played Arthur Lee Allen in David Fincher's Zodiac, talked similar to the killer. These three people don't remotely sound anything alike, and so because of that, we can't trust her word on if Gajkowski actually sounded like the Zodiac or not. This at first glance significant evidence is easily debunked. There is much more that has been said about Gajkowski as the owner of TheZodiacKiller.com also lists him as the prime suspect, and in there we have even more falsities mostly coming from Blaine. If we mentioned every single one of these lies, 
we would probably be here until the new year. Basically though, the main reason I want to mention Gajkowski wasn't even for Gajkowski itself. It was instead to show just how caught up and obsessive people can get in cases like these. After all, that was the central theme in the Zodiac film, and as you can see, it is absolutely true. Both in the first suspect we went over, and here too. That about wraps this suspect in our Zodiac saga, so let's move on to the next one. For the fourth suspect on our list, we are going to be going over a man named Larry Kane. The thing that stands out with Kane among all the other suspects is the eyewitness accounts. Now I know what you might be thinking. We've already talked about the unreliability of eyewitness accounts, so why are we taking it as evidence? Well here's the thing with Larry Kane. Nine people were shown a picture of Larry Kane and identified him as the Zodiac Killer. And that's, well, a lot of people. It's one thing for someone to say that you were the Zodiac Killer once, but when it's nine? That's something. This is the reason Kane has become a popular suspect over the years, and that is a big deal. However, here's the thing. These nine identifications are kind of taken out of context, so let's look a little deeper into them. One of the supposed witnesses, a police officer named Harvey Hines, actually identified Kane as a possible suspect in the murder of a woman named Dana Lull in Nevada. This identification does not count because it revolves around an entirely different case that is not connected to Zodiac. Another one of the witnesses talked about it online and mentioned seeing Kane at Lake Berryessa on the day of the attack, where he also claimed they saw the Zodiac victim swimming that day. This is a lie, as Brian Hartnell has stated that neither he nor Cecilia Shepard went swimming that day. This witness cannot be proven anyway, it's just someone on the internet claiming things, and we all know you can't take that at face value, so neither will we. Kathleen Johns was someone who claimed to have been abducted by a man who resembled the Zodiac sketches, and the Zodiac himself claimed credit for the attempted abduction. In 1992, she identified Kane as her abductor. For this one, we actually can't directly disprove or prove anything here at all. We have no way of knowing if she actually was almost kidnapped by Kane or not. Unlike the other identifications, outside of some minor details being changed over time, there isn't much to contradict this claim. So basically, we can't prove or debunk anything here at all. Brian Hartnell himself was interviewed in 1994, and he stated that Kane's voice and speech pattern was somewhat similar to the Zodiac Killers, and also claimed that he would never forget that voice. However, a few years later, he said that maybe he could forget that voice. He also never outwardly said that this is indeed the same voice, so it's not strong enough evidence. The next witness was Dan Fook, the cop that at the time unknowingly drove right past the Zodiac Killer, right after Paul Stein's murder. Fook stated that the jowls matched up and the face was rounded like that, but since it was 20 years later, he couldn't know for sure if this was really him. He did however state that out of the hundreds of pictures he had seen over the years, this was the one that stood out the most. Still though, Fook only gave it a maybe, which again isn't a ringing endorsement. One more thing to add, he drove past him, which means that in reality he probably saw him for maybe 10 seconds, which is a ridiculously small amount of time to catch a solid glimpse of someone's face. Overall, I don't think this proves anything. The next witnesses belong to the aforementioned family of Darlene Farron, who, as we mentioned way back, have a very suspect stalker theory going on. But as we said, the story there was continually changing, so we are also not going to consider their identifications of Kane to be valid either. So, as you can see, nearly all of these identifiers were sketchy at best, meaning the seemingly impressive amount of witnesses' evidence working in Kane's favor doesn't hold a lot. Kathleen John's identification remains the only notable piece of evidence, but one piece of identification isn't enough to seal the deal. As one last thing to note, Harvey Hines, the police officer we mentioned before, began a minor investigation into Kane, and he took his fingerprints with suspected Zodiac fingerprints, and it was not a match. So yeah, despite seemingly entirely plausible at first glance, Larry Kane is not our Zodiac killer either. Well, at this point, we are almost finished with all of our suspects. For our second to last suspect, we are going to go over a man named Richard Marshall. For Marshall, he has a multitude of interesting aspects that make him seem plausible, so let's take a look at all of them. For one, Marshall was super into old films, and one of his favorites was The Red Phantom, which was mentioned in one of the Zodiac's possible final letters. 
Another film he was definitely aware of was the 1932 film adaptation of The Most Dangerous Game, which is possibly alluded to in the Zodiac's only cracked cipher. Marshall also reportedly lived in a basement apartment in San Francisco on Scott Street, which is pretty close to the final confirmed Zodiac kill. To add on to that, the Zodiac mentioned having a basement in multiple letters, which is important as at the time, there was not a large enough number of basements in the San Francisco area. He also previously lived in Riverside in 1966, possibly connecting him to Sherry Jo Bates. However, of course, Marshall still falls short in a few ways. For one, he also failed the fingerprint test, and two, and perhaps more importantly, there isn't a single piece of proof that points to him being a violent person at all. He was quite the odd fellow, but odd doesn't mean murderous. Plus, when you think about it more, a person that happened to be into classic films and also lived in San Francisco isn't shocking. A lot of film buffs and directors lived in the area, like any area really. Overall, as you can see, there were some interesting parallels, but until more definitive proof comes out that he had violent tendencies, I just don't see it. The late Napa County Sheriff Detective Ken Narlow said it best, Marshall makes really good reading but is not a very good suspect in my estimation. And at long last, we've made it to the final suspect of our video here, and we're going to be discussing the case of Earl Van Best. And this one here is going to sound a little familiar. The reason I say this is because it's a case of someone pinpointing their own father as the Zodiac. Many people have claimed their father was the Zodiac Killer since the 1960s. Notable examples include Dennis Kaufman accusing his father Jack Terrence in 2007, and an old friend of ours, Steve Hodell, who as we all know, was convinced that his father George Hodell murdered Elizabeth Short. Well, in 2009, he claimed his father was the Zodiac along with dozens of other killers. None of these people are as famous as Gary Stewart, though. Stewart claimed that his biological father, Earl Van Best, was the Zodiac Killer. His novel, The Most Dangerous Man of All, described the search for his biological father and his eventual realization that he was likely the Zodiac Killer all along. The theory has gotten a lot of traction, even resulting in a TV miniseries this year. But was Van Best really Zodiac? Let's take a look at the evidence. A lot of Stewart's evidence comes from his belief that the ciphers say his father's name. However, his evidence for these often relies on assumptions rather than actual proof. For example, he claimed that because an unsolved cipher contained 13 symbols and his father named had 13 letters, this could not be a coincidence. Really, I shouldn't even need to explain why this is a stretch. There are loads of other deciphering moments that supposedly spell out his dad's name, but for every one of them he never offers a legitimate reason to believe him other than the fact that he said so. In the description of this video, I put down a link of all the rest of their methods of code solving being debunked, so if you want more reasons not to believe this part of the evidence, you can click that link. But with that being said, let's go on to other pieces of evidence. Another large piece of evidence belonged to some of the fingerprint readings. At the very last Zodiac crime, there were fingerprints found at the one scene, and at one point, Stewart went to have these fingerprints compared. While the police could not make a positive match between the possible Zodiac fingerprints and the fingerprints of Van Best, he did provide a visual comparison of both fingers. However, both of them featured what seemed to be a scar. However, for whatever reason, Stewart assumed that the suspect fingerprint in question was reversed, perhaps only to suit their needs reversing it made it match better. Not only that, but it's possible this faint line on the finger was only there as a result of the indentation on the surface of the cab. Some people like to claim the fingerprints in questions weren't from the Zodiac, but there's no documented or witness-based evidence saying otherwise. It's just something people like to say when DNA evidence doesn't match their favorite suspect. And make no mistake, Van Bess fingerprints did not match. He also mentioned that Van Bess was charged for statutory rape and uses that to prove that he was capable of such disgusting, immoral actions. While it definitely demonstrates that he was capable of some despicable, horrible acts, it doesn't prove that he was a murderer. There's also more typical pieces of evidence that you can find for a lot of the other Zodiac suspects out there, such as Van Best slightly resembling the famous sketch, and Van Best being in California at the time, both of which are close to meaningless for obvious reasons. And of course, this would not be complete without claims of a police cover-up. Because the police wouldn't allow him to see Van Best's police file, he automatically claimed a cover-up was happening, perhaps an excuse to help him explain his lack of actual evidence to attribute the crimes to his father. Oh, and Google isn't helping at all either, as when you Google the Zodiac Killer, Van Best's photo is the first one that shows up.
And that's about all for Earl Van Best over here. And by extension, this concludes all the suspects that we have laid out in this video. As you can see, misinformation involving the various suspects is everywhere. Nearly everyone has a significant misconception or flat out lie somewhere, but as a great man once wrote, when the truth gets buried deep beneath a thousand years of sleep, time demands a turnaround, and once again, the truth is found. Now, who was the Zodiac Killer? Well, this is our best guess judging by the evidence available. Appearance-wise, he was probably in his mid-30s or maybe older. However, this is the aspect we will likely forever know the least about, due to the vastly changing eyewitness accounts. He likely had military experience at decryption. Psychologically, his boasts about slaves were probably lies, as we all know he was about attention. Nearly everything he did was done to intimidate and scare others, as being the boogeyman was his greatest desire. He also wanted to show off how smart he was with the letters and ciphers. The unsolved ciphers may have no real answer, and if they do, he didn't give away his identity. His actions indicate a mix of narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Each crime was different in weapon usage and tactics used, both as a way to confuse law enforcement and to correct errors done in the previous attack. He knew none of the victims. It was purely random. He took credit for crimes he didn't do, possibly including Sherry Jo Bates and Kathleen Johns, among others. Perhaps by 1974, he felt he had completed all his goals and stopped, similar to Ed Kemper. Does this describe any suspect? Sadly, it doesn't, indicating that most likely, similar to the Golden State Killer, the real murderer is somebody no armchair detective has considered. Overall, this video took on quite a different end result than I expected. Usually with a murder case, there is at least one substantial lead that makes sense, and when coming into this video, I obviously expected that to be the case. But, as you can clearly see, that did not happen. This is one of the few times where I genuinely believe that none of the existing known suspects are the Zodiac Killer at all. While most of them have at least one suspicious aspect, none of them have remotely come close to enough evidence to prove they are the Zodiac Killer. This has become a highly controversial case over the years, with so many people losing so much due to obsession. Still, at the end of the day, I don't believe the Zodiac hides within anybody that we know. He haunts California like a ghost. Always heard, but never seen. Perhaps recent DNA techniques will one day reveal who the Zodiac was, but nothing is certain. Down through all eternity, the crying of humanity was his wish, and he no doubt got everything he wanted and more. Maybe somewhere in the country, an old man sits, still waiting to be found, half a century later. This is a video we debated making for a very long time, as we didn't know if we would truly be able to add anything after so many videos and pieces of media had been made about the case. But I realized that within each suspect came a cesspool of misinformation and out of context evidence, so hopefully all of you watching could learn something here today. Hopefully one day we will finally figure out, once and for all, who was the man behind the most infamous unsolved killing spree in American history. Hi, and welcome to Debunk File. My name is Sep, and at long last, it is Halloween, the greatest time of the year. You've enjoyed our dives to the depths of the strange and undiscovered horrible killers this debunked over, but it's time to cap it off with the scariest of all horror, the jump scare. For Halloween, we wanted to do something special. This video is going to document the history of the jump scare, from movies to games to everything. This won't be a comprehensive list of every jump scare ever on screen, but we want to dissect and discuss the most influential scares in cinema, and of course, the scariest. With all that out of the way though, I think it's time to just begin. So grab all of your Halloween candy and get ready. First, we must discuss what a jump scare is. I'm assuming many of you already know, but we are going to be as technical as possible when describing it. A jump scare is defined as a surprise scare that comes out of nowhere, and normally functions as the climax of very intense scenes and media. Of course, over the years, the jump scare has been overused and has even lost its original intent. As we stated, their original purpose was to finish an intense scene in the scariest possible way. But nowadays, more often than not, 
they will just be used for cheap and oftentimes false scares. The overuse of the jump scare has led us all to expect them, and when that happens, the fear factor is gone. But today, we're just going to be looking at the very best. We'll see how the jump scare began, how it evolved over time, and of course, break down the best that has ever been put on screen. What was the first jump scare? A quick Google search will reveal the first jump scare hailed from the 1940s horror film, Cat People. This jump scare is extremely important, but we can't start with this, as the jump scare actually goes much further than that. Keep Cat People in mind, as it will come back very soon, but it's time to talk about the first jump scare ever. The first horror film ever made was titled The Haunted Castle and was released all the way back in 1896. This film was not only the first horror film ever, but holds the very first jump scare in film history. This film seems to follow a haunted house where we see things appear out of nowhere, and at one point, a skeleton appears out of nowhere behind the main character, greatly startling him in the process. There's no sound of course, but the skeleton truly does appear out of nowhere, and with this being the first horror film ever, this would set the precedent for every jump scare to ever come. It's a very interesting footnote in cinema history, and something not many people are aware of. Even we weren't aware of it before we began researching for this video. With a prototype being from 1896, it's time to ponder what the actual first true jump scare was. After many hours spent searching every website trying to find what it may be, Jif and I settled on the classic 1925 film, The Phantom of the Opera, as having the first real jump scare. The scene is built up and extremely tense, even for today's standards. As the woman creeps up on her masked captor, hoping to see his face, she peels back his mask for the music to intensify and the phantom to jerk back and reveal his hideous visage. This scene was built up way before the film was even released, as in promotional footage and pictures advertising the film, Lon Chaney's ghastly phantom makeup was nowhere to be seen, and in the film, it was greatly built up as well. This was the first time the audience laid eyes upon this monster of a man, and it is truly terrifying even today. This would set us on our path of the modern jump scare, and is extremely overlooked by the rest of the film. Granted, this is by far the most famous scene, but it's not considered by many as a true jump scare. But alas, the pieces are all there. Tense atmosphere, unsettling music, and boom, the surprise and shock. I can only imagine how terrifying this scene would have been all the way back in 1925. A true modern jump scare, which will lead us into our next landmark in the history of the jump scare. Finally, Cat People. The film most people associate as having the first ever jump scare, and there is precedent as to why people perceive it as such. The jump scare in this film was the very first sound jump scare. The atmosphere in the scene is thick. It follows a woman running away from something or someone. She is paranoid and looking behind her while speed walking, with the only sound being her footsteps. When she finally gets to catch her breath and the movie goes quiet out of nowhere, a bus comes out from the corner of the screen and loudly screeches to a halt. This could even be considered the first false jump scare, as it's not something remotely scary at all, made more scary by loud noises and context. It's another historical landmark on our journey. I'd say Phantom and Cat People definitely defined it, and when put together, there's a perfect jump scare there. With the more historical ones out of the way, I want to move up in the timeline, analyze a few jump scares over the decades, and watch how each evolves and influences the next. After Cat People, jump scares weren't as common as they are today, but the next one comes from the 1950s classic, The Thing from Another World. The scene begins with a man lying down on the floor after being attacked by the titular Thing from Another World. The men slowly move towards the door the injured man was pointing to. When they open the door, boom, there it is. It's a very slow burn and unexpected jump scare. At the time, it would have been expected that the Thing wouldn't be there and would have been a fake out. But no, the thing is there in all its growling glory, scares the living crap out of the crew members. The music is loud and brash, and so is the thing. The movie was the precedent for the thing from 1982, and the original had some very slow burn and terrifying scenes, including this jump scare. Moving forward into the 60s, 
Horror is truly becoming a different genre, and Psycho is the most famous of the 60s horror flicks. The Alfred Hitchcock classic. Hitchcock directed a multitude of freaky 60s movies for sure, but nothing stands out and has stood the test of time more than Psycho. Of course, we aren't talking about it for no reason. It too includes a few jump scares to boot. Let's take a look at him. I want to address probably one of the most famous scenes of all time, the shower scene. It's one of the greatest, scariest, and most influential scenes in all of horror. But it sure does get all the love. I want to analyze some of the more underappreciated scenes that just happen to be jump scares. The first one is the mother scene. It follows our now main character slowly walking down the steps to a basement hiding from Norman Bates himself, and as she approaches, she sees his mother sitting in the dark basement. When she tries to get her attention, it's revealed that the woman was all but a rotting corpse. It zooms in on her decaying, terrified face and the iconic music blares while the woman screams in horror, and Norman suddenly appears wearing his mother's clothes, all while holding a knife. This is another very slow burn jump scare with amazing effects and an equally fantastic payoff, as not only is it incredibly effective, but it also completely throws the narratives on its head. And of course, there's that music. It's still so bone chilling to this day. As I watched it to write this video, I still got chills. Just classic. The next jump scare from Psycho is quite similar, but the payoff is a lot more sinister. It follows a man walking into a house and slowly up the stairs until the mother runs out of the room and suddenly stabs him in the head and he takes a tumble down the stairs. We knew it was coming, but man is it scary. And again, the music just makes the scene so hard to watch all these years later. Truly both of these classic jump scares can compete against nearly any modern one. The 60s includes another very interesting and albeit extremely creepy jump scare. It hails from the film Repulsion from 1965. The scene follows a woman walking into her room very slowly, but also very nonchalantly unexpecting of what's to come. She opens the closet, and when she closes it, the mirror on the closet door reveals a man standing in the same room as her. It's a fast and super out of nowhere scare. It really reminds me of most modern out of nowhere scares like the lipstick demon from Insidious, which of course, we will get to. The scene is tense, but you don't know why until the scare hits and it completely shocks the viewer. This one in particular has aged exceptionally well and I can truly only imagine what this was like in 1965 seeing it for the first time in theaters. Moving on to my personal favorite decade for jump scares, we have the 1970s. Here we are going to analyze a few from this era starting with 1975's Jaws. The scene in question starts with some men going underwater to examine a sunken ship. Tensions are already high as the notorious shark could be anywhere, lurking or stalking. The diver carefully and slowly examines the boat when he gets to a compartment where he opens it only to see a severed head missing an eye pop out with some insanely intense music. This is a genuinely effective jump scare, as I still vividly remember this one making me leap out of my seat the first time I ever saw it happen. But of course, Jaws does have one other scene that is most definitely a jump scare, and while I don't believe it is as technically effective as the aforementioned one, it is essentially the most famous scene in the whole movie, and that is of course, the scene where Bruce finally appears for the whole crew to see. This movie is part of what makes Jaws so genius, and that's because Bruce literally appears out of nowhere each time. They can be on the hunt for him and he's a complete no-show, but then they can be in the middle of a conversation and he jolts out of the water, like the scene here, and it is incredibly startling each time. Moving on to our next jump scare of the 70s, and we have what might be the single best jump scare in history. I am, of course, talking about the ultra-famous chest-bursting scene in Alien from 1979. This is likely a scene that you have all seen already, but still, let's go through it. It begins with the entire crew eating while aboard the ship. Everything is normal, until one of them begins getting sick. He's throwing up, and while that's not alright at the end of the day, they aren't thinking that much of it. That is, until he begins screaming in agony. At the point, the audience is most certainly getting suspicious, but what happens next could not have possibly been predicted by anyone. As he is laying on the table, all of a sudden, blood jolts from his chest, 
It isn't particularly loud, but it is horrifying. It comes out of nowhere and puts so many questions in your head. But then, the true scare happens. Again, out of nowhere, a baby alien bursts out of his chest. There is not a single thing the crew can do but watch this thing as it ominously stares back, until it scampers away. This is a hard scene to judge because it is so famous, but seriously, put yourself in the perspective of somebody in 1979 seeing this film for the first time in theaters. This is absolutely horrifying and is not just one of the best jump scares of all time, it is also one of the best scenes ever in a horror movie. The 1980s is known as the era of the slashers, and it's fitting that the first jump scare we are going to mention from this era belongs to arguably the most famous slasher film of all time, Friday the 13th. In this film, Jason is mentioned for the entire film, but you never see him at all. Instead, the intention is actually all on his mother, who is the actual antagonist of the movie. For the jump scare, the reason why it's so effective is because of what occurred before it. The character in the boat right here just got finished dealing with the horrifying mother who nearly killed her multiple times. It was an exhausting escape, and here she is, laying in a boat, finally getting some rest. It's a happy ending. I mean, just listen to the music. But then, Jason. Who was mentioned all throughout the film, but was never seen, leaps out of the lake and takes the titular character with him. This scene literally breaks all the rules. The movie was over, we had our happy ending. For that to happen is so unexpected. I still can't believe it to this day. That is why it is easily one of the greatest jump scares of all time. We mentioned it before, but now it is time again to talk about The Thing, which is also no stranger to the art of the jump scare. As you all know, the basic summary of the film is the fact that the alien in question can shapeshift, meaning nobody can be trusted, and nobody is safe. Luckily for our crew, they were able to find out that the thing's blood reacted in a strange way when touched with a hot substance. As a result, they all draw blood and do this experiment. As the scene goes on, there is no music at all, and there is barely even any sound. We see the intense, untrusting, angry facial expressions of the crew, as they are all at odds with one another. Towards the end of the scene, ironically, when some talking actually begins, he takes some blood without truly focusing on it, and boy, does it react. It shoots up into the air, creating a shrieking noise, and it's all downhill from there, as the thing fully manifests and begins attacking. This is a very unique jump scare that somehow combines intense buildup with being out of nowhere. These two terms sound like they shouldn't be able to coincide, but they somehow do, and it makes for one of the most terrifying jump scares in history. The 90s was an era that, during my research, I actually found to be slightly underwhelming, especially compared to the two decades that came before it, and the ones that followed it. But there is one movie that has an incredible jump scare, and it actually hails from one of the most unexpected movies ever, and that is The Exorcist. No, not that Exorcist. I'm actually talking about The Exorcist 3. This jump scare is so good, I've seen in top multiple lists for being the single best jump scare ever put to film. Well, enough talk about it, let's actually analyze it. This is a long scene that basically depicts a hospital in operation. It's a very quiet scene, as it just involves a nurse and various other people walking around while the camera remains stationary. After basically an entire minute of seeing essentially nothing absolutely out of nowhere, a patient comes out with a knife and murders the nurse, with some extremely loud, bombastic music playing. This is one of the purest examples of ending a scene in the worst possible way, which is what makes it so effective as a jump scare. It doesn't just relieve tension in a dumb way, something genuinely horrifying also happened. And now, the modern age of the jump scare will begin, and that of course starts with the 2000s. The scene in question here is the infamous, I saw her face scene in The Ring. In this scene, we have two people talking about the ring curse. They begin talking about the girl, when all of a sudden, it cuts to her gruesome, twisted face with equally disturbing music to boot. This is one of those scenes that doesn't even feature a second of build-up, and I actually still vividly remember this one scaring me many years ago. 
But now for the era I wanted to talk about the most out of any in this entire video. The 2010s are freshly over, but man was it a ride, and it was very interesting in many ways too. The 2010s allowed for the widespread creation of media in every form, with film of course included. This allowed for more great scenes in horror than ever before, but also of course allowed for more bad scenes than ever seen before. This is the decade where jump scares unfortunately became a cliche and lost a lot of the punch that they had before. With that being said though, let's just get into the jump scares of this decade though, because as we said, the 2010s truly had some special jump scares regardless of the oversaturation. Let's start with the ultra famous Lipstick Demon. This has quickly become the most iconic jump scare of the 2010s, and it absolutely deserves every bit of attention it gets. A true out of nowhere scare once again. This scene revolves around a lady discussing some paranormal activity regarding this family's son. She is talking about seeing an entity point at the kid, and during her explanation, we see a flashback of it happening. It's a tense scene, and maybe you could see a jump scare happening in the flashback itself, but then out of nowhere, this demon appears right behind the father, making for the most unexpected scare you will ever see in a movie. Again, there was no signal at all that a demon would just suddenly appear right next to this family, especially when it's so bright and sunny in the setting like this. This is truly one of the greatest jump scares of all time in my opinion. But the 2010s does not stop there. As stated before, the fact that essentially everyone could make something now included opportunities for people that would never have had them before. We saw short films being uploaded to YouTube, and while of course many weren't good, there were some true gems along the way, and none of them shined more than Lights Out. This short film was so good that it actually got an entire feature film made about it which I highly recommend as it is truly fantastic and has some of the best jump scares of the decade belonging to it. But we're actually going to just talk about the short film this time. The gimmick behind it is the fact that the demon in it only appears while in the dark. A woman here is heading to bed and turns the lights off when she sees an entity. But when she turns it back on, it is no longer in sight. She begins slowly flickering the lights and the tension is almost unbearable. You know this entity is going to do something at some point but you don't know when. And somehow, even though I've seen it before, the point in which it appears right next to the door frame still gets me. But that's actually not even the only jump scare in the film. And the following one, which is less infamous, might even be more effective. This opening scare establishes the fact that this entity can only appear in the dark. With that in mind, you are naturally horrified by the dark, and so you don't want that to happen. The main character tapes the hallway lights on so it can stay on, but tension arises like crazy when the lamp starts flickering and the hallway light still shuts off. We hear noises and see the sheer horror of the main character's face, but after this entire struggle, she gets the lamp plugged in all the way. She's safe, right? The entity appears with the lights on. This completely breaks the rules and results in an incredible scare. And for the final jump scare we have here for the 2010s, we want to give a shout out to the movie It Follows for this incredible scene. Basically, we have a typical case of a woman being terrified by a demon that no one else believes in. So of course, she looks insane to her friends. At one point, her mother knocks on her door, but the character here is convinced that this is not her mother, but a demon instead. To really no one's surprise, the door was finally opened, and what do you know, it was her mother. However, what nobody expected was for a demon to actually appear behind the mother. This is horrifying on its own, but what makes it so effective is the look of the demon. For it, they actually got 7'7 seven seven Mike Lanier to be the demon, and his presence is just terrifying. This demon completely commands the frame, and his size is haunting. The music isn't actually that loud when he appears, but the insanely unexpected nature of this still counts it as one in my book. With all this out of the way, that about wraps up the history of jump scares in horror. But what about jump scares in non-horror movies? The goal of the jump scare is to surprise you. And what's more surprising than a jump scare in a movie that isn't even supposed to scare you? Because of this, these jump scares can even be more effective than ones in horror movies. Because at least there, you kind of figure you'll get at least one. But enough talk. Let's take a look at a few of the best jump scares ever from non-horror movies. We're going to start with Pee-wee's Big Adventure. That's right, 
This innocent movie has a horrifying jump scare. I'm sure if any of you have seen this one, you'll never forget it. Especially since a lot of people saw it at a young age. But this one really is amazing. Pee Wee gets a drive from an old lady named Large Marge, and the atmosphere goes from the usual innocent to creepy, as she begins explaining a horror story. And then, as the story gets more intense, this happens. It looked like this! <laughs> This may not look too terrifying without context, but keep in mind, this was watched by many kids at the time, and with the extremely lighthearted atmosphere of this movie, this came absolutely out of nowhere and has forever been etched into the minds of kids everywhere. But by far the best jump scare ever in a non-horror movie is one that I'm sure you all thought about instantly when even hearing that we would cover some of these. And that is, of course, the Bilbo scene in Lord of the Rings. In this scene, we see our main character with the ring hidden in his shirt. Bilbo, up to this point, has been an incredibly nice person, but the second he even sees a sliver of the ring, he just... snaps. <coughs> Not only does this scare the living hell out of you, but it's also a genius way of showing the sheer power that this relic has on people and the world around it. This is some genuinely terrifying stuff, and only foreshadows what else there is to come. And well, with all of that now being finished, that about wraps up jump scares in cinema, from the very start all the way up to now. But cinema isn't the only place jump scares exist. Some of the best jump scares you will ever see exist outside of movies, and are instead within the world of the internet, or better yet, video games. Online Phenomena was already somewhat taken care of earlier as Lights Out, the short film, was actually uploaded to YouTube. But one of the most famous jump scares of all time actually took place on the web. And you all know what that is. That's right, the scary maze game. We're not going to spend too much time talking about this because there really isn't much to say, it's just a stupid little prank. But this stupid little prank was so famous, it genuinely increased the popularity of jump scares as a whole majority. So I wanted to mention it for that. Thank you, scary maze game. Anyways, outside of the internet, we of course have video games, which have given us some truly amazing jump scares over the years. When compiling up a few of the best from video game history, I wound up getting super curious and wondered what the very first video game jump scare was, and I found that it was significantly older than I ever could have expected. According to my research, the very first jump scare ever in a video game was from all the way back in 1984, in a game on the Atari 5200 called Rescue on Fractalus. In this game, you are in a ship, and at one point you can see an alien running out the ship, before it disappears from view. It's gone for a few seconds, where it then suddenly appears at the window and breaks a hole, and this is accompanied by a loud noise. For being the first ever jump scare in a game, it's actually pretty effective, and I can't even imagine how scary that would have been at the time. But now, on to some of the best. And of course, I have to mention Amnesia. Released in 2010, this game literally became famous for its jump scares, which were actually quite unique as they weren't triggers like in most other games. You had to run into them, by either hallucinating with the game's sanity meter, or more commonly, running into the monster that follows you throughout the game. But as far as popularity goes when it comes to video games and jump scares, there isn't even one that comes close to Five Nights at Freddy's. Think whatever you want about the game, but its influence on jump scares within the industry cannot be understated, and it was single-handedly responsible for introducing likely millions of kids about jump scares in the first place. While the jump scares did understandably get old, I'll still never forget the first time I got spooked out while playing it. And now, for real this time, that is going to wrap up our deep dive into the art of the jump scare. Again, we know this video was very different than the normal video, but we wanted to do something special for Halloween. With that being said, I hope you have a marvelous Halloween. Horror is an iconic staple in cinema and has been for over 100 years. The genre has produced hundreds of classic films that have been and will be forever cherished by fans, cinema buffs, and the average moviegoer. Throughout time, the horror genre has derived many of its scares and important scenes from real-life actual tragedies. It's not uncommon for a horror flick to start with the words, based on a true story. And many of them actually are, with most of the original story thrown away in favor of a more dramatic retelling of what happened. 
This time of year is absolutely perfect to discuss horror flicks, and for this Halloween, we thought we'd bring you something truly thrilling. One thing horror pulls from is inspirations from famous serial killers throughout the ages. Texas Chainsaw Massacre was inspired by Ed Gein. Psycho was inspired by Ed Gein. Silence of the Lambs, of course, inspired by Ed Gein. The House of a Thousand Corpses and Devil's Rejects films were inspired by, you guessed it, Ed Gein. Regardless of the fact that a lot are based on one particular serial killer, it's not uncommon for a film's premise to derive its twisted plot from a serial killer's infamous story. On this channel even, we've covered multiple disturbing serial killers that wound up becoming inspirations for large pieces of media. The Black Dahlia case got a film adaptation, the Zodiac Killer got a film adaptation, and perhaps most currently relevant, Elizabeth Bathory has inspired multiple film characters, and has even escaped films entirely to become a massive inspiration in the Resident Evil series. But what about the other side? We know of films based on serial killers, but what about horror films that inspired a killer? Believe it or not, there have been multiple confirmed cases of this. Though, as we'll see, the individual circumstances regarding many of these tragedies may certainly be interesting, to say the least. Whatever the case, today we're going to go through a list of some of the most heinous murders that took place in the name of a famous horror film. There are others that were inspired by non-horror films, such as Taxi Driver, Fight Club, and even The Dark Knight, but to keep this video somewhat consistent, we're going to strictly be discussing horror films. Mark Branch was an 18-year-old grocery store clerk who had a sort of obsession with horror movies, specifically slasher flicks. His favorite being the Friday the 13th series, and of course its main attraction, Jason Voorhees. A local video store owner commented, he rented strictly gore, period. The gorier, the better. The idea that movies are just movies, and even some of the goriest films can offer up some fun, scares, and even introspection into the character's psyche, wasn't enough for Branch. This outlook of the gorier the better intrigued Sharon Gregory, a freshman psychology major at Greenfield Community College. At just 19 years old, her whole life was ahead of her, and with her passion in this field, she wanted to do a psychological profile on Branch. Police later confirmed that this wasn't even a school project, nor did the two have any strong relationship. Rather, this was something Gregory wanted to pursue on her own volition. While she was doing this, Branch somehow got wind of the profile that was being done on him, and on October 24th, 1988, he put on his Jason-inspired attire, wearing a hockey mask and black boots. That night, Sharon Gregory's body was found by her twin sister in their bathtub. She was stabbed multiple times in the head, abdomen, and chest. The police immediately began looking for Branch as their number one suspect after the Gregory family showed them the psych profile Sharon had created on Branch. A few days later, Branch's car was found and was covered in blood and abandoned in the woods. The police notified the area to be on the lookout for a Jason Voorhees copycat killer. The town of Greenfield was rightfully shaken by this event and cancelled their annual Halloween parade and postponed the premiere of Halloween 4, under the assumption that Branch, loving slasher movies, might take this opportunity to strike again at the film's showing. State police mentioned the search being made more difficult by a growing nervousness in the community and repeated rumors of other stabbings. Greenfield High School, where Gregory had been attending less than a year ago, offered counseling for its distressed students. Halloween came and went, and Branch was absolutely nowhere to be found. Psychic John Monty was tasked to help on the case. Yes, you're hearing that right and led the police department on a wild goose chase claiming that he could sense where the killer was. The police chief later commented on Monty's so-called premonitions by saying, We would find him behind a white farmhouse with a dog. That describes half the houses in this town. With no good leads and a psychic running around, the trail went cold until November, when a hunter traveling through the woods found Branch hanging from a tree. This death has since become disputed as the town was highly aware of Branch and had some local vigilantes. We can't know for sure if this death was by Branch's own hands, or the vengeful people of Greenfield. The coroner figured it most likely happened the night of Sharon Gregory's murder. When the loose ends were tied up, the local media took the Jason-inspired story and ran with it, making it more sensationalized than it actually was. 
In reality, this was just a deranged, pathetic young man, without any sense of reality, who went out one night to reenact a horrible scene from one of his favorite movies, leaving the Gregory family broken and a young woman with a knack for psychology dead at the hands of a copycat fictional killer. The Branch family denied any evidence to be published, and the paper psych profile on Branch has since been lost. This bizarre copycat killing ended with a quote from the police chief, David McCarthy. He was so entrenched with Jason that he had to have the final chapter in his own feelings. He wanted to know what it felt like to live out the part of Jason. Nightmare on Elm Street is one of the freakiest 80s slasher flicks due to its premise of an invader causing death to anyone through their dreams, and its villain, the burnt-faced dream lord of Elm Street, Freddy Krueger, has become iconic. Daniel Gonzalez frequented his viewings on the film and many others like it. Throughout his life, Gonzalez suffered with many mental health conditions and was described as a promising but dark and troubled young boy, which is something we will get back to. By the time Gonzalez turned 17, he had received some psychiatric help, though it's unclear as to exactly what that was, and also proved to be incredibly ineffective. When he was 24, he had no job and was living solely off of drugs and horror films. On September 15th, 2004, a drug fueled Gonzalez told Peter King, a 61-year-old resident of Hillsea, Portsmouth, that he was going to kill him while he was walking his dog with his wife. Luckily, Gonzalez was fought off, but fled the scene and headed to Hove. In Hove, he stabbed 74-year-old Mary Harding to death while brandishing a Jason-esque hockey mask. Gonzalez would then return home. On September 17th, two days after the initial killing, he traveled to Tottenham, where he stabbed 46-year-old Kevin Malloy in the face, neck, and abdomen, leaving the man dead. A few hours later, Gonzalez broke into Kumis Constantino's home, where he stabbed the man in his arm, but luckily this time, Gonzalez was fought off and again fled. One hour later, he tried to access multiple homes in Highgate. There, he murdered couple Derek and Jean Robinson. Later, after leaving the scene, a decorator then saw him running nude and covered in blood and reported him to the police. Gonzalez was captured at the train station trying to buy a ticket with a blood-soaked $20 note and was then held in Broadmoor Hospital in Berkshire. In just two days, Gonzalez had killed four people and injured two more. All that is clear is that almost all of these people were elderly, which is something that surely would have been by design. The holding prior to the trial was not easy, as Gonzalez tried to bite himself in a main artery and had to constantly be accompanied by riot police. When his mother and grandmother came to visit, he was still extremely violent, grabbing their hair through the bars. At his trial, he pleaded insanity in hopes to get a lower sentence, but was denied. He was given six life sentences. Throughout this all, Gonzalez was writing letters to himself as Zippy, a past alter ego. His letters were extremely dark, and in one of them he describes the spree of murders as one of the best things I've done in my life, and how similar he was to Freddy Krueger. In the specific murder of the Robinson couple, Gonzalez noted that it was orgasmic. But there's even more to Gonzalez that we haven't even explained yet. Before Gonzalez went on his horrific murder spree, his mother tried to get him help. Many who knew about Daniel Gonzalez knew that he had some terrible mental health issues and was never really able to get the help he deserved, being ignored by authorities and social services. Through research, I saw some quotes from his stepfather that mentioned Gonzalez having paranoid schizophrenia. Something that is really chilling is the fact that we have some of the letters that were sent to social services by both his mother and himself. In one letter to social services, his mother cried, Does my son have to commit murder to get help? which is absolutely chilling after discussing the events that did unfortunately transpire after Gonzalez was denied any professional help. One letter from Gonzalez himself said, I really do need help now. I've tried to cope on my own like a normal human being without help or medication, but I have not managed to succeed. I was admitted to hospital in 1998 under section 37 of the Mental Health Act. I do not want this to happen again, so I really need to go to the hospital voluntarily and receive treatment under the care of the doctors before my mental state gets worse. Please, please help me. This is very urgent. I really, really do need medical help to find the correct environment and the correct medication. I need to take this in a controlled hospital environment. Please, can you help me? I really would appreciate if you would help me improve as I am in a desperate situation. This desperate plea for help is once again bone-chilling considering what would happen just one year later. 
in the thought that a day could come where suddenly he snapped, and it officially was too late, is terrifying to think about. Around the same time, the European Court of Justice was reviewing life sentence cases, arguing that they could be a violation of human rights, and that they would review each case and redo the ones that didn't deserve a life sentence and new trial. Whether or not the courts were going to review Gonzalez's case is unclear, but before any consideration at all, Gonzalez was found dead in his cell at the Broadmoor Hospital. He had taken his own life with a CD case. At the end of the day, a human being took the lives of four innocent people and injured two more. In all ways, for reasons that should not even need to be explained, there will never be an excuse or a justification for something like this. But looking deeper into the case can at least partly explain why these things may have happened, which is always important to ponder. Gonzalez was a deeply unstable individual, who clearly was a ticking time bomb, and sadly, the chances that there were to possibly prevent this were not taken, and innocent lives were instead. Gonzalez was a horrendous case. But this, in a morbid sense, could serve as a cautionary tale for authorities to look at and hopefully take more action when someone is in desperate need of help, especially when one's own mother is pleading that he could be capable of murder. To be fair, I'm sure it would have been hard to predict that something this horrific was to be in that range of outcomes, and in absolutely no way would we ever suggest that the blood should lie on anyone other than the man who committed these acts. But it is shameful and scary how easily these pleas for help were dismissed. When someone with warning signs this extreme is dismissed, it makes me think about all the other people that may message these hospitals begging for help that don't receive any. And in that sense, it's a pretty cruel and heartbreaking reality to think of. Taking this case earlier may have spared the lives of four innocent people, people that we hope are resting easy. For now, we can only hope that future cases similar to it can be stopped before they even start. Vampires are everywhere in the media. It's genuinely really hard to get rid of them. There's so much vampire media, even diehard vamp fans can't name every vampire movie. As a surface level vampire media enjoyer, the film The Vampire Chronicles Queen of the Damned never really crossed my radar. Although it starred the late singer Aaliyah, it seems I'm not the only one who has never heard or seen anything about this film as it tanked at the box office, not really living up to its role as the spiritual successor to the highly popular film Interview with a Vampire. Alan Menzies, however, was a huge fan of the film, seeing it over 100 times. Menzies seemed to always be a troubled and violent kid. At 14 years old, he stabbed one of his classmates and was known to capture, kill, and skin wild animals. After the attack, Menzies spent three years in a young offenders institute. It's unclear as to where his obsession with the vampire film began, but regardless of how it started, Menzies was entranced and like I previously mentioned, watched the movie over 100 times. He was particularly fond of the main vampire, Queen Akasha, who would regularly appear in Menzies' hallucinations. At one point or another during a hallucination, Queen Akasha promised the man that he would be able to become an immortal vampire if he murdered someone as a sacrifice. Thomas McKendrick was Menzies' childhood friend, who, despite the troubles that Menzies endured, stuck around him. To his family, he was always described as having a big heart, and this loyalty was perhaps something that exemplified this. On December 11th, Menzies' childhood friend Thomas McKendrick somehow disrespected Queen Akasha. Menzies claimed at that moment to have seen the vampire queen demanding blood. In a blind rage, Menzies used a hammer to hit McKendrick 10 times. He then pulled out a knife and stabbed his friend 42 times. After the horrible event took place, it only got worse. Menzies then proceeded to drink two glasses of McKendrick's blood and then went on to eat a part of his friend's skull. McKendrick was buried in a makeshift grave. It would be a few weeks before McKendrick was found. He was said to have normally been very well in contact with his family, and so when it was holiday season, and it was now days since he was last heard, this created a sense of panic. These days became weeks when he was finally found in a horrific state. Menzies was captured by police and awaited his trial. A few weeks after his capture, the authorities found McKendrick's body. Menzies' trial consisted of him pleading insanity and that in the moment of the murder, he had snapped into some altered state as well as claiming, At the end of the day, I knew I would have to murder somebody anyway. It was the only way you could do it. If you don't murder somebody, you couldn't become a vampire. 
During the trial, three psychologists diagnosed Menzies as having a psychopathic disorder, but couldn't come up with a mental illness that could divert the blame for Menzies' own responsibility, and not a debilitating mental illness that caused the murder. Menzies was found guilty on the murder charge and was sentenced to life in prison. A year after his sentence, Menzies was found dead in his prison cell by his own hands. The entire case lacks a lot of information on Menzies specifically. There is an obsessive theme in all of these cases, but particularly this one where the character Menzies idolizes would actually talk to him and convince him to commit a horrible act. However, from here on we can unfortunately only speculate on Menzies. What has been shown is that Menzies was proven to be incredibly violent even in his youth, before he was watching this film and seemingly having hallucinations from this vampire. The only known constant in this case is the name of the man that he killed, and we can only hope that Thomas McKendrick is resting in peace. Michael Myers is THE slasher, the mass killer who essentially popularized the slasher genre. He wasn't the first, but that's a topic for another time. Halloween was huge, being the most profitable independent film of all time, and of course, coming out of that were its many sequels all starring the silent, cold, slow, Captain Kirk-faced killer. In 1981, Halloween 2 was released, and wasn't as well received as the original, but to this day it does still have its fans one of those fans being Richard Delmar Boyer. Not much is really known about Boyer's life, at least nothing on the internet that I could find. One of his only major notes was that he was a handyman. Francis and Eileen Harbitz were neighbors of his, a very polite elderly couple that seemed to be on good terms with Boyer, as he was supposedly good friends with their son, William. This was so much so that they would invite him over for dinner, and even loan him money and hired him to perform odd jobs around their modest home. On December 7th, 1982, Boyer was once again invited to have some dinner at their house, and it seemed that things began relatively normally. They were supposedly conversing while eating soup when suddenly, Boyer seemingly snapped and stabbed Eileen 20 times in the neck, chest, and back, and stabbed Francis 23 times. As he left, he took $50. Their son had found their bodies nearly five days later in a pool of blood. William made what he called a long-shot suggestion to Fullerton police, that Boyer might be the killer because he had done gardening work for the couple, owed them money, carried a sheath knife, and became violent when drunk, which in turn led to the police arresting him. This is where the case gets weird. As this action actually sparked a controversy at the time and led to some issues down the line, which we will soon get to. During the trial, Boyer confessed to the killings and said that he went over to the Harbits household to borrow money. While on the way, he had smoked some PCP and apparently had a flashback to the film Halloween 2, where Michael Myers breaks into an elderly couple's home to steal a knife and then murders both of them. Boyer claimed to have seen Halloween 2 multiple times while high, and claimed that it was the film's fault for the murders, and sought an acquittal as a result of this. His first trial was a hung trial as the jury could not come to a clear conclusion. In 1984, during his second trial, a psychopharmacologist testified that the murders were indeed a drug-induced flashback to the film. Halloween 2 was shown to the jury, marking it the first time in United States history a future film was used as evidence in a murder trial. At the end of this trial, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. However, in 1989, Boyer was retried due to his Miranda rights being violated on several occasions. The justices held that Boyer had been taken from his home to police headquarters and questioned at length before there was sufficient evidence to justify an arrest. Then after Boyer called an end to this questioning by asserting his right to silence and legal counsel, police improperly resumed the interrogation in violation of his rights under the so-called Miranda Rule, the court said. To make it worse, this so-called long shot that William gave was not considered sufficient enough proof to arrest, but they came to his residence, arrested him, and during the interrogation when Boyer asked if he was under arrest, Detective Richard Lewis repeatedly dodged the question. When Boyer stated that he didn't want to talk anymore and wanted a lawyer, Lewis told him to sit tight. In 1991, they had found that Boyer's was linked to another murder, that being of John Houston Compton in 1980. The district attorney stated they would not pursue it in case it distracted from the forthcoming retrial. By 1992, the jury finally found Boyer's defense improbable. He was tried for the last time and was sentenced to death. As it stands today, 
Boyers is still in prison. What truly makes this case stand out among the others we discussed, besides the fact that it was full of several blunders, is that it's almost identical to the murder that happened on screen. It's not just inspired or a copycat, it was an almost one-by-one -one horrifying real-life recreation of a horror scene, which really sets it apart from almost every other case of this sort. For our last case of the night, we are going to be discussing someone extremely famous, the infamous Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, Dahmer has been covered to death on YouTube and documentaries, books, and just about everything, so you won't hear the entire story here, as many other creators and historians have covered it way better than we ever could. However, there is a side to the Dahmer story I've really never heard. Granted, I never really knew much about his story anyway, but this really intrigued me while researching cases for this video. Dahmer was obsessed with the 1990 horror sequel, The Exorcist 3. When Dahmer was arrested, he told Detective Dennis Murphy that he bought the film on VHS and watched it around three times per week for about six months straight. Dahmer would sometimes watch the film with his victims, with them all being unaware the man they were watching it with was pure evil. One account came from survivor Tracy Edwards, who agreed to Dahmer's $100 payout for anyone who would pose naked for him. Edwards, after entering the killer's house, was handcuffed to his bed and forced to watch The Exorcist 3. Edwards claimed that Dahmer began moaning and rocking back and forth while watching the movie. Edwards was lucky enough to escape, beating Dahmer over the head and leaving the house, leading Dahmer to finally come to justice. In court, Edwards testified a chilling remark Dahmer made while the film was on. He put his head on my chest, was listening to my heart, and said he was going to eat my heart. Tracy Edwards would understandably never be the same after this horrific event. After this incident, he was left homeless and was in and out of different shelters, and was reported telling his defense attorney that he would, in quotes, never be able to be the same. He stated that he would have frequent nightmares, and then began suffering from alcohol and drug addiction, among other things. In an ironic twist of fate, 20 years after all of this in 2011, Edwards would be arrested and pled guilty to throwing a man to his death off a Milwaukee bridge. It's not exactly clear as to what the motive for this was, but he didn't do it alone. Edwards was ultimately charged with homicide and pleaded guilty to aiding a felon, which got him a reduced sentence of one and a half years. After this came out, some people looked more into his history and found some truly disturbing things, such as another previous arrest from before the incident with Jeffrey Dahmer. At that time, he was already a felon and was even charged in an SA case involving someone who was underage, an absolutely horrifying revelation to find out. Something we do and will always do is dig into the story behind victims of these tragic cases whenever we can. As has been shown in past videos, most of them were average, innocent people with relatable struggles, but sometimes something like this can happen, where even the victim turned out to be awful too. Like I said before, this is just one footnote I found interesting that ties into the entire history of Jeffrey Dahmer. Of course, if you are interested in his entire story beyond just the chilling accounts of his love for The Exorcist 3, you're in luck, because there are essentially a million different places for you to learn about that horrid man. With that, we come to the end of our search to find some of the most horrifying and terrible murders that were done in the name of horror films, and in my head, there is one common theme that binds the majority of all these cases together, and that is responsibility. The big theme and takeaway here for me is that of responsibility, and how all of these people tried to divert their own responsibility away. For whatever these people want to say, these things still happened with their own hands, and there will never be any undoing that. With this theme of responsibility coming up, I find it important to ponder the notion of whether killers are created or just born, a subject that has for a long time been quite the debate. Oftentimes, I see what seems to be an overwhelming level of sympathy towards many killers, and how many of them are tragic since they were meant to end up this way. Even in this video, the case of Daniel Gonzalez in particular is one of those. While it is true that he and the majority of other killers are dealing with extreme undiagnosed mental health conditions, abuse, and other sorts of extremes, there are also sadly millions of other people that deal with many of these very same things that don't go on to become humans that cruelly and selfishly take lives. Daniel Gonzalez claimed that he couldn't possibly be held responsible, 
for it was just his alter ego. Alan Menzies claimed that he couldn't be possibly held responsible, for he too was in an altered state. Richard Boyer claimed that he couldn't possibly be held responsible, for it was the film's fault for invading his mind at that moment. The notion that a movie can in fact inspire someone to commit murder is also an interesting one. While this video was themed around this fact, after hearing all that we have heard today, I would like you all to think about whether these movies really served as inspirations for these heinous acts or not. Some of these killings featured memorabilia from specific films. Some of these killings even mirrored certain scenes in horror films. But obsessing over a movie or any form of media is not ever going to serve as the true inspiration or motivation behind taking entire lives. There will always be much more to it. Unfortunately, this thought process is one that is still sadly very common. Today there is so much to be said about how video games directly lead to violence, or that violence in video games are inherently negative. In the most extreme of cases, certain games have been blamed for horrible tragedies by media outlets and people. How different does this sound than Mark Branch, where the media latched onto an arbitrary connection to Friday the 13th and ran with it, causing pandemonium for months and supplying a scapegoat. Many people can see through this, but many people still do not. A statement that has clearly remained true since long before any of these people that we talked about today. As a huge enjoyer of the horror genre and slasher subgenre as well, we all have to keep in mind that they are, at the end of the day, just movies, and the actions of these individuals doesn't make the people who enjoy this kind of media all secret killers. Demonization of the media often makes the average person terrified of things that are completely harmless. The stories we discuss today are horrifying, but it's important to remember that the true responsibility should always be pegged onto none other than those people themselves. Happy Halloween and happy Debunktober guys, we really hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe. If you like the channel, make sure to check out our social medias in the description below. Make sure to stop by our Discord, it's the best place to chat with us and hang out with fellow debunk enthusiasts. Of course, if you'd like to support the channel, please head over to our Patreon, Debunk Plus. Only a dollar a month and you guys get access to videos early, script PDFs, whatever random stuff we decide to put up, and more. As always, my name is Seth from Debunk File. See you guys next time. Happy Halloween and happy Debunktober. Bye.